Uh, my name's Ross McGill. Uh, thank you to Louise for inviting me today. I've been reading everything that you've been getting up to. Sounds like a very exciting couple of days. Uh, I am currently working in a secondary academy in North London as an assistant vice principal. Uh, I've been there for three years, Greg City Academy. Uh, just one of the top most 100 improved schools uh, announced last month. Uh, been doing assistant vice principal for about six years, two different academies. Uh, prior to that, I was a head of technology in a school uh, not far from where I am working now in North London. Uh, and I've been teaching food tech for since 2000. So hopefully I got some credentials there. <laughs> so I know, uh, I know where you're coming from. Uh, I'm not here to talk to you about outstanding today because I believe it's a myth. I do not believe outstanding lessons exist every single day. They don't exist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can I go home now? <laughs> uh, and they don't exist every lesson. And as a senior leader and as a classroom teacher, I've passionately believed that. Uh, if you're not familiar with what's going on in kind of the online world with dialogue with bloggers against Ofsted, you know, there's a whole debate going on about the question of one-off judgments and the validity and reliability of this. So I can go into that a bit later. So I'm not going to talk to you about outstanding. Uh, so change of plan. I'm going to talk to you about saving time, which seems to be crucially very important in a food classroom, but for every single teacher. Uh, before I get into all those different ideas, I've been reading this book by Robert Caldini, Influence. And it's all about cognitive thinking, and I would highly recommend it. And I'm not even really into the book yet, and already I've, been, I've captured these two buzzwords that I absolutely love, pocket strain and brain strain. Now, if you're not familiar with what these might mean, let me explain. Pocket strain, money. Okay, we like things for free. We go to jewelers. Something's very expensive. We add more value to it. Brain strain, equally the same. Sometimes when we invest in a lot of time, we value the output. Equally, when we're pushed for time, especially in the classroom, day-to-day -day, uh, lessons, we need things that are a quick fix. So it has double meanings. Uh, so I'm going to revisit this throughout. So I'm hoping today that I can give you a bit of brain strain solution and some pocket strain solutions. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of a poll just to kind of get, capture my audience a little bit better. Uh, hands up if you're a primary sector or early years. Let's have a look around the room. Okay, no one from primary. One, two or three. I'll accept that, thank you. Okay, a little bit. Little. Uh, so secondary. Okay, vast majority. Uh, further education. Any other sector that I might have missed? Anyone from over middle school? Great. Overseas, anybody? Okay, good. Uh, all right, let's get a bit more detail. Any tweeters out there? Tweeters. Okay, any blog readers? Any blog? Any bloggers? Okay, I knew the hands would disappear then. <laughs> right, well, I'm a passionate blogger, and all I'm simply doing is putting out my, what I love and getting loads of feedback, and it's... You know, personally, it's spiral out of control. Okay, and if you can spare the time to share any good pieces of work that you do, I would highly, highly recommend that you do it. Uh, I was going to try and be fancy and do this poll, but the browser is very old, so I can't do it. So we'll ignore that one. So here are my top five ideas for you to take away. Okay, the first one I'm going to. This is my only physical activity for the presentation, so I want you to get involved. The rest of the presentation is boring, so you need to get a pen and a scrap piece of paper, please. Okay, A4 or A5 will do. Caldini. Caldini. Okay, paper. Make sure you are willing to give the paper away. Oh, sorry, I should have said that. <laughs> okay, here we go. Right, on the paper, write your name in the corner, and can you draw a big circle? As big as possible on the paper. Okay, I call this literateness. Do it in any classroom. Okay, big circle. Okay, sick pizza, a little food link there. Three lines across the circle, six pizza slices.
Okay, numbers one to six. Anyway, mix them up, go clockwise, anti-clockwise, there's no rule. Right, now we're gonna get busy. Okay, so make sure your name's on the paper. Now, I'm essentially showing you something you can do in the classroom. Uh, in slice one, in slice one, can you spell these words? <laughs> Life skills. No cheating. Life skills. Include the hyphen if you wish. Okay, word two, complex. First slice only, yes. Three words in slice one, apologies. Third word, commercial. Commercial. So in slice one, you should have life skills, complex, and the word commercial spelt correctly. Okay. Next. I'm only going to say this once, so listen very carefully. When I say go, you've got 10 seconds. You crunch your paper into a ball. You lob it as far as you can across the room. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> if no one picks up your paper, you're out. And if you don't pick up a piece of paper, you're out. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> okay. Sitting down. Thank you. <laughs> what have I caused? Okay. <laughs> okay. Open up the paper. Open up the paper. Add your name to the sheet of paper as well. Anywhere will do. In slice two, can you spell check any words that are not spelt correctly? If they're all spelt correctly, leave pizza slice two blank. Okay. Moving on. Slice three. Three more words. Spell these words, please. Okay. Number four, analysis. In pizza slice three, please. Word five. Vocational. Word six, specialist. Right, you know what to do, 10 seconds. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll give them to Louise or I'll, I'll put them out somewhere. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, pizza slice four. Spell check any words on the entire document, especially if you've not seen it before. Recorrect them if needed, redrafts. And put your name on it, please. So now it should be three names on a piece of paper with six words. Okay, last round. Four words coming up. Pizza slice five. Word seven, rigor. Rigor. Word eight, rigor, sorry. Word eight, progression. Progression. Word nine, I'm only gonna say once because you're all food specialists. Colloids. And word 10, I'm only gonna say once. In fact, I'm gonna whisper it. Caramelize. Okay. Now, sorry to ruin your fun, but we're not going to carry on throwing it. <laughs> What's the point? Okay, so let me uh, tell you what literacy, literacy, uh, lit, literacy. Lit, not literacy, what I call literateness. Okay, my little idea. It improves literacy, subject knowledge. You can do this before 
a lesson coming up, okay, or after a lesson, as a starter, a plenary, especially in the food room. It engages even the oldest students straight away, okay? It builds up all that knowledge, it's fun, it's active, okay? What I tend to do, after we get all the bits of paper, I stand at a certain part of the room with a bin and I ask them to all throw it at me, but the ones that get in the bin, I will look out, I'll take out, we'll do a spell check. And if you want yourself a cheap visualizer, the 50 pound on Amazon, IPEVO, I-P-E-V-O. I-P-E-V-O, brilliant little visualizer, plug it into your computer, you can put the kids' words underneath the camera or any piece of work. Really nice little solution for yourself, portable, it plugs in anywhere. Very, very handy. Okay? Now, if you're wondering where those words came from, they came from the last Food Technology Report 2006, which I believe you've already seen today. Okay? All those words came from that report. Okay, so that's number five. I'm going to speed up a bit. Number four. Saving you time. Five minute marking plan. Now marking, there's five key stakeholders with marking. Okay, obviously we've got the parents, we've got the senior leadership team, we've got inspectors, of course we've got teachers, and at the centre of all that, the child. Now, ask yourself, who benefits from marking? Parents love marking. They love it. The senior leadership team love marking. They love it. Inspectors, I've given them big lips because they really love it. But teachers don't like it. And the child often left bemused. Okay? Not knowing what to do. And they seem to be the least beneficiaries. Okay, so we could call it, this is uh, from a friend that I blog with, Stephen Lockyer, Marking is broken, and he's right. So how do we fix it? How do we stop ourselves slipping up? How can you improve your quality of your marking and the time that it takes? So I had a discussion with my boss the other day, and essentially once we've done all our marking and scrutiny and going around the school, there's two or three teachers that have just not marked back to September. It's so diabolical, really. It's unacceptable from September, that's nearly five, six months with no marking. And we essentially want our teacher to do three key things, plan, teach, and mark. And that's how we've kind of been brainwashed. Plan your lessons. Case Day was here at the front, taught me how to be a teacher, taught me everything I know uh, from Goldsmiths. Plan your lessons, teach them well, mark your books. But let's flip it on our head. Let's mark your books first to inform your planning to then pl uh, teach your lessons better. Okay, simple way, I know, but I'm going to show you how. Here's a five minute marking plan. Okay, now it doesn't do your marking for you, I'm sorry to say, but if you look carefully, if you can see it, I'll put all this online later, but you've got, it kind of is a good thing to use to plan a scheme of work. What do you want to mark in that scheme of work? You don't need to mark everything. Why should you mark everything? It's not possible. It kind of looks as, are you going to do summative or formative? Are there common errors that keep coming up? What parts do you need to reteach? If you're doing a one-off uh, unit test or an exam, again, you could use this for the same purpose. So it allows you to focus on what you should mark. So I'd highly recommend giving it a go. Okay? Time spent marking must help. Common errors, it helps you identify common errors. Why address all the issues in a child's book when all the class are, are getting stuck with one key point? Make that the thing that you should be marking only. Help students correct and improve, okay? Reteach parts of the lesson, inform future teaching, and that's it. So I would highly recommend you give that one a go. Smart ass, I wanna be a smart ass. What I mean by ass is assessment. Okay, I want to be a smart assessor. If you're not familiar with the acronym DIRT, Directed Improved Reflection Time. I now make this the fundamental thing I do every timetable cycle, so that's every two weeks. Even if it's just 10 quality minutes, every child looks at a piece of work, piece of marking, and reflects, writes a comment, or improves. Even in busy food technology lessons. Make it something you live by. 
This has transformed my teaching this academic year. Marking, feedback, redrafting. Why? Because it improves the quality of your teaching and the quality of learning. This, I've, I, I got these three, I did a two-year MA, that's what I came away with. What, why, how? Why? I now have these little speech bubbles. I get the kids to scribble them in the corner, even if the work's beautifully neat. Little scribble in the corner, tell me what's on the page, Johnny. Why have you done it? How did you do it? And it's fantastic to put into your coursework on every, slide, on every little piece of A3 paper or digital slide, whatever you use for your coursework. It's evaluation and analysis throughout your whole project. It tells you instantly what the child's understood. They're reflecting. And then you can pass it around. They can peer assess. Okay, what, why, how? So smart ass, how does it work? Keep comments diagnostic. Be hard on content, soft on the person. Well John, done, Johnny, you've done really well today, but that is not acceptable. And then you go into explicit assessment criteria and say exactly what they need to do. Evidence of acting on feedback, okay? By reflecting, by getting dirty, they can show evidence. Okay, and it's not just for Ofsted, it's for you. It's for the child. They can see that they are making progress. Going back to the key stage three strategy, donkeys years ago, do a triad or a quadruple, get them to swap documents. Sounds, we all know it, but do it, make it routine, and it'll transform your classroom. <coughs> transform the culture. Make it routine to consolidate, that's what getting dirty is. Directed, improved reflection time. Take time out from the busy bandwagon of food technology in your curriculum and having to come in and get busy and get your aprons on, things like that. You must have a time to do a bit of theory, so use that to consolidate. Don't always have to go into evaluations or planning for a recipe. There's other ways you can do that, and I'll show you how. Fail. First attempt in learning. Make everything the first attempt. Second attempt, third attempt, before it's submitted for marking. And each time it's redrafted, the child should be improving it throughout your direct instruction. So that when you actually come to mark the real piece of work, they've already edited it three times at least. Okay? So that's smart ass. And essentially we're wanting the students to work harder and you to work less. Then you can start to mark smarter, be a smart ass. Don't forget this slide I had at the start of the screen, okay? I'm going to ask you to share later. If you could share a bench with someone in education, who would it be? Okay, just a little side part. Right, number two, take your way home. It's one of my favourites at the moment. Certainly can be used in food tech. Here's an example. Uh, Nando's menu. I'm going to explain how it works. Okay, you might have seen these on Twitter if you're a tweeter. So take your way home. Now, how this came to be, I have been teaching in four or five classrooms for the last two or three years. I've also not just been teaching all the areas of technology, but I've now been finding myself teaching media studies, psychology, and plugging gaps where we haven't been able to appoint members of the staff. So going to different rooms across the school is very stressful. You need to adapt and survive your management skills. And takeaway homework was a result over the last two years for me. To take something into a classroom that I don't know, wasn't sure where the resources were, I needed to set, Homework, but at the same time, I wanted to set differentiated homework. I didn't want every child to get the same one. So takeaway homework, you'd have to do a bit of thinking prior, so 20 to 30 ideas, divided them into starters, mains, desserts, so exactly like your curry menu you get at home, okay, ranging in difficulty and differentiation. So you might want to include chilies, vegetarian logos, little symbols that kind of insinuate to the child what they, what they can expect. Include a statement, so a bit of context, maybe success criteria. Make sure it literally is takeaway. Now, the reason I stress that is because I worked in four or five different classrooms, sometimes in one day. And it's impossible to have that conversation, make sure that the child uh, takes that away, knowing exactly what they need to do. And you'll be so surprised by opening up the freedom for them to return with any platform to report their homework, whether it's a blog, they make something, they write a poem, they sing and dance their homework to you. That's, for me, that's very creative. And it totally would transform how you set homework. So maybe give that one a go. Here's two examples. There's another example. It was one of the kind of first I got back from people on Twitter. And this was a technology one that I got last week. So I thought I'd stick that up for you to have a look. Okay. 
And you should start to see that kind of outcome in your classroom. Easy to do, kids up there, write number two down. Be flexible with the dates. Don't expect it back the week after. Give them an extended learning project. Once a term, once a half term. Now, homework. If you're, I'm sure you've all heard Hattie and visible learning, things like that. Now, in my school, our students do not have a place to go and work at home. They do not. They don't have a safe, quiet place. Certainly, uh, we're on the 0.55 minus deprivation scale, if you know what that means. So we've got very low... Uh, student backgrounds. Parents certainly don't care in most instances. So this Hattie research is with context. It means it's nothing to me it, with my students in my school. Okay, so uh, what's the point of me setting homework if my children aren't going aren't to do it? So here's the difference. What can I do above the effect size and influence of what homework has at home environment? So I've circled them. If you can't read them, going from bottom to top, so there's home environment here, direct instruction, being explicit with what you need the students to do. Second one up, teaching strategies. So take away homework, some of the other ideas that I've given you today. I'm sure you've got plenty yourself. Feedback, hard on content, soft on the person, explicit. Not wishy-washy and trying to cover every single area, just being focusing on one. And then the top one, clarity. So I'm going to come to this one later, stickability, I call it, on the five-minute lesson plan. Okay, so those would dramatically improve the quality of me setting homework in my school, in my context. So it will be very different for yours, I'm sure. Now, five-minute lesson plan, hopefully you've heard of it. So before I go into this, I'm not promoting the five-minute lesson plan as the be-all and end-all. Okay, I'm its biggest critic. Okay, and the reason, again, working in loads of classrooms, busy, 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 we need a quick solution. And I'm not saying you can plan a lesson in five minutes, but you can certainly think about what you want to do. Now, the five-minute lesson plan, let's just rewind a little bit. There's a lesson plan from my school five years ago, two academies before it converted. Minute by minute, activities, everything listed. And did I look at it in the class when my tutor or my head teacher was observing me? No. Just paper-filling exercise. And I'm absolutely certain at least half the audience here do this kind of stuff when they are being observed formally. Chuck it out the window. Take a risk. Five-minute lesson plan. So what it is, it focuses on the key parts. Now I'm going to come back to stickability shortly, but essentially the big picture, objectives, engagement, AFL, all the key parts. I've got a video if I've got time. I don't know how long I've got left. I'm nearly finished. Am I okay? Okay. All right, so I'm just going to stick this on shortly. You can see how it works. This is a food technology example.
that's essentially it. So, uh, let me give you a little visual analogy. If I've got K over here, my appraiser come to observe me formally, formal lesson plan hat, okay? Sometimes when I'm busy, go to the DKL, doorknob lessons. Let's start the lesson as I go in. No lesson plan. Five minute lesson plan sits in the middle. Time saving, oops, time saving. Still addresses all the key issues and it still doesn't take that much time, okay, out of your day-to-day -day life. Uh, so some facts, five facts. Almost quarter of a million downloads or just more, 140 countries, nine languages. Recognized by Ofsted, I'll show you a quick uh, excerpt. Used by examination boards. Uh, from PGC all the way up to SLT, all sorts of institutions, okay? And there are countless subject variations online. Here's a nice food version someone sent to me, okay? So there are, there's a template online, you can get it on my blog, and you can adapt it for yourself and give it a go if you fancy it. Okay, now here's an oxymoron. Ofsted do not require a lesson plan, but evidence of a lesson plan. <laughs> what? So tell that to your SLT. Okay, no lesson plans. Now, I'm not saying Ofsted say and we should do, okay, but it's just something to bear in mind. So, the boring bit. Observations, what do Ofsted say? So, this was back in September. They evaluate the quality of teaching overall, where every school in the entire country has gone wrong. We've adapted it for an individual lesson. We've come in, I've observed this young la uh, lady here, and it's for a performance. It might not be one off. Okay, it might be that she uh, has, does it all the time, she's got nervous. Okay, or she's pulled out all the stops and it's outstanding. But would it be like that tomorrow morning? with year nine on a rainy day. So that's where we've all gone wrong. Inspectors will not look for a preferred methodology or a teaching style. Okay, so if you wanna do didactic lessons, go ahead. If you wanna sit all your students in rows, go ahead. Okay, what works for you is best. You know your students better than anyone else. Okay, they also go on to say, they'll not expect teachers to prepare lesson plans. So why am I showing you a five-minute lesson plan? Because it focuses you on what's important, okay? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got a result of my blog, and I was invited to meet Mike Cladenvall in the middle of the white shirt uh, at Ofsted headquarters. And a few other bloggers, uh, we all shared our thoughts. And, you know, with the amount of readers that I've now got, if I expose something, then people have... The, I'm not saying I'm making Ofsted accountable, but it certainly makes people raise their heads. So Mike got wind of the five of us and he invited us in. Uh, we're certainly not representing the teaching community, but these are the kind of things that came out as a, of a report that was published last week from this meeting. Inspectors should not give a grade, okay, for a lesson. Teachers should not expect one. If asked, inspectors can give you feedback. Inspectors must ensure feedback does not constitute a good teacher. So we're getting into grey waters here. Okay, evidence gathered directly or indirectly should, uh, about individual teachers should never be used for performance management. Okay, so make sure your school knows these things. So if you haven't read that document, get on the Ofsted website, download it and share it by email across your entire staff. Okay, and there's lots more I could go into, but I'm running out of time. Uh, this is a school report last year. So if you can't read this, let me read it out. Ooh. Let me get rid of that. It says lessons are planned using the recently introduced five minute lesson plan which focuses clearly on what students will learn, how they will learn and what successful learning will look like. Teachers say that planning this way has really helped them improve the quality of their teaching. Okay, I was gonna show you that video so I'm not, let me get rid of that. That's what I've just showed you, sorry. Uh, and I used to take quite a lot of pride in getting these messages but I don't anymore because Obviously, 140 characters doesn't give you the context. Has Joe got outstanding over time? Or was it a one-off performance? And has that appraiser or senior leader come in and observed them for a performance, for a show? Reliability and validity is being questioned all the time at the moment. So no lesson plans, no one-off judgments. Now what? 
Okay, so for me, this is just my story, I'm focused on stickability. So all my lesson plans are out the window. I just focus on what I want students to leave my lesson with, what key points I want them to bring back, okay, and that's essentially it. I'm focusing on the learning. So this is a great grid by Stephen Tierney, he's on Twitter too. Now this works for anyone. Requires improvement, people stuck in the mud, people uh, a bit deluded, tired. You, even you're good to outstanding teachers who need a bit of focus. Learning games should be tight. You should be very explicit on what you want the students to achieve. Okay? Your structure, your lesson planning should be loose, flexible. Things can happen. Okay? But essentially you're focusing on the learner. And I think that's a really nice little grid. And especially if you look at the kind of requires improvement level where... Learning is loose, let's see what they discover. I'm really focused on the lesson plan and at 26 minutes past nine, I'm gonna move on to this activity because my lesson plan dictates so. Okay, and then I'm focusing on the activity, not the learner. So I've got lots of different five minutes, okay, and I'm not saying that things can be done in five minutes, but the little formats allow you to just focus on what's important and you can download them and do it to suit you. This is just what suited me, and I've shared it online, and a lot of people just seem to like it, which is nice. Okay, but I would like you to have a look at that and see what suits you, and I'm happy to put some other ones on there if you've got some other ideas. Uh, 30 seconds, 15 seconds each. Turn to a partner and sh answer this question to each other. If you could share a bench in someone with education, who would it be? I cheated. I'm giving you another question to think about. Are you consistently the sort of teacher you would want your own children to have? Are you the teacher your children have? So I'm presenting so I can do what I want. Uh, I couldn't go away without showing you uh, my answer. Uh, now this is a recent answer for me. My entire pedagogy has changed as a result of having my beautiful little boy three years ago. And it's totally overhauled my thinking, having to apply for schools in the future. I've been in the system 20 years. It's going to be new for me. It's scary. And the reason I'm putting that there is I don't want to really sit with Gove or Mike Cladenbowl or do what Ofsted say. Bring it back to the child. And I know it's a cliche, but it's important. Look at the environment, how they learn. Am I the teacher that I would want another teacher to teach the child? My son. That's the question, that's the quality we should be aspiring to. And it's not possible to be outstanding every day. Far from it. I'm not. Some, if you judge me, I'll be inadequate some lessons, other lessons I'll pull it out of the bag. But do my children make progress? I'd like to think that they do. I'm happy to take questions, I'll stick around. You can tweet me if you wish, if you're on that. Uh, otherwise, thank you for listening. Mm.